This afternoon, I'm going to address a series of questions. What is natural law? What is the natural law theory of human dignity? What is the natural law theory of human rights? Do ideas and beliefs about God and the divine play a role in natural law theory? How are natural law theories similar to and different from other leading theories of morality, especially utilitarian and Kantian, or so-called deontological theories? And finally, are natural law theories fundamentally concerned with rules or with virtues? Now, one's knowledge of natural law, like all knowledge, knowledge in any field, begins with experience, but it does not end or even tarry there. Knowing is an activity, an intellectual activity to be sure, but an activity nonetheless. It's not just an experience. We all have the experience of knowing, but to know is not merely to experience, where the mind simply passively records information. Knowing, rather, is a complex and dynamic activity the role of experience in the activity of knowing is to supply data on which the inquiring intellect works in the cause of achieving understanding. Insights, what we have when we understand stuff in physics or the other natural sciences, in historiography, in philosophy, in mathematics, in just the common sense we use in navigating our way through the world, Insights are insights into data. They are, as the philosophical theologian Bernard Lonergan brilliantly demonstrated by inviting readers to observe and reflect on their own ordinary intellectual operations, the fruit of a dynamic and integrated process of experiencing, understanding, and judging. Knowing is a kind of unity of those things. Yes, we experience, we take in data, but we actively use our intellects to grasp the intelligible realities in the data, to grasp intelligibilities in the data, and then we make judgments based on our grasp of those intelligibilities. So what then are the data supplied by experience that are at the foundation of our practical judgments? That is, our judgments with a view to action. When I say practical here, I don't mean merely pragmatic. Those of you who have studied a bit of Aristotle, especially Aristotle's ethics, will know that when I say practical, I simply mean with a view to action. So what are the data supplied by experience that are at the foundation of our judgments with a view to action, our practical judgments? It is those insights that constitute knowledge of natural law. Well, those data are the objects of intelligibly choice-worthy possibilities, possibilities that in as much as they provide reasons for our actions, reasons of a certain sort, that is more than merely instrumental reasons, things that we grasp as being worth having, worth doing, worth realizing, worth participating in for their own sakes and not merely as means to other ends, we grasp as opportunities. So, to get concrete so that it's not so abstract. In our experience of true friendship, and all of us have had friends, right? We've all had the experience of, we don't have any Ebenezer Scrooges out there, right? We all have friends. In our experience of friendship, where we're not just using each other, we're real friends. We grasp, by what is ordinarily an effortless exercise of practical reason, the intelligible point of having and being a friend. We understand that friendship is desirable not merely for instrumental reasons. Indeed, a purely instrumental friendship would be no friendship at all. But above all, for its own sake. Because we grasp the intelligible point of having and being a friend, and we understand that the fundamental point of friendship is friendship itself, and certainly not extrinsic goals to which friendship is a mere means, we reasonably judge that friendship is intrinsically valuable. We know, in other words, that friendship is a constitutive and irreducible aspect of our well-being and fulfillment, and that precisely as such, friendship provides a reason for action of the sort that requires for its intelligibility as a reason, 
no further or deeper reason or subrational motivating factor to which it is a mere means. You don't have to explain what it is that you personally are getting out of that friendship in order for someone to understand the intelligibility of your being that person's friend. He's your friend. The friendship itself is the justification for the friendship. It's not that, well, because I'm his friend, I get invited to the really good parties with the beautiful people. Or it's not, well, because I'm his friend, I have access to his powerful father who can get me a loan or get me a job or get me something that I want. No. Whatever that is, that's not friendship. If there is such a thing as friendship, it's a non-instrumental reality. And of course, we all grasp the intelligible point of friendship. The same is true if we shift our focus from friendship to our experience of the activity of knowing itself. In our experience of wonder and curiosity, of raising questions and devising strategies for obtaining correct answers to those questions, of executing those strategies by carrying out lines of inquiry, of achieving insights, we grasp, again, by what is for most people in most circumstances an effortless exercise of practical reason, the intelligible point of searching for truth and finding it. We understand that knowledge, though it may have tremendous instrumental value, knowledge enables us to build bridges and do all sorts of wonderful things, its value is not reducible to its instrumental value. Most fundamentally, our knowledge is intrinsically valuable. We want to know the truth for the sake of the truth. We don't want to be in error. We don't want to believe falsehoods. Even if the truth is hard, we would rather know the truth than live a lie. To be attentive, informed, thoughtful, clear-headed, careful, critical, and judicious in one's thinking and judging is to be inherently enriched in a key dimension of human life. If somebody says, well, why do you want to be clear-headed, attentive, careful in your thinking, critical in your judgment, judicious in your, your reasoning, you don't need any explanation beyond the fact that it's better to be those things. We reasonably judge the activity of knowing then to be an intrinsic, or what I and others call a basic human good. That is, again, a constitutive and irreducible aspect of our overall or all-round or integral flourishing as human beings. Now, if what I've said about knowledge and what I've said about friendship and could say about other basic human goods, other ends or purposes that provide more than merely instrumental re uh, reasons for action, if what I've said is true, then our knowledge of natural law is not something that sometimes people say it is. It is not innate. In other words, it does not swing free of experience or the data supplied by experience. Even when it's easily achieved, practical knowledge, knowledge of natural law, is an achievement. It's the fruit of insights, which like all insights are insights into data, data which are supplied by experience. The insight, the knowledge that friendship, for example, or knowledge itself is intrinsically humanly fulfilling, is ultimately rooted in our elementary experiences of the activities of friendship and knowing. You grasp the intelligible value of friendship in your first childhood experiences of genuine friendship. The experts on these matters tell me that the smallest children, when they begin playing together, don't yet have the idea of friendship. They, they get the idea of playing together, but they don't yet have the idea of willing the good of the other for the sake of the other, even intuitively. But they get it, and they grasp it, and they see the point. In their interaction, they actually become, make, understand the point of friendship. Apart from some experience of friendship, or some experience of moving from wondering about something to figuring it out, from ignorance to knowledge to truth. Apart from those experiences, there would be no data on which practical reason could work to yield understanding of the intelligible point and thus of the value of friendship or knowledge and the judgment that these activities are intrinsically fulfillments of the human person 
and as such, objects of the first principles, what the great medieval theologian Aquinas called the first principles of practical reason and basic precepts of natural law. Natural law thinking begins from our intelligent grasp of the intelligible reasons, the most basic intelligible reasons we have for our actions, our insights into the data of our experiences of friendship and knowledge and critical aesthetic appreciation and so forth. Now, it's important to understand that not all practical knowledge is, strictly speaking, moral knowledge. Not all knowledge that guides us toward action is moral knowledge. That is, knowledge of moral norms and their correct applications. Though, all moral knowledge, precisely because it's action guiding, is practical knowledge, or centrally includes knowledge of principles for the direction and guidance of action. Yet knowledge of these most basic, most fundamental practical principles directing action toward the basic human goods and away from their privations, though not strictly speaking knowledge of moral norms, is foundational to the generation and identification of moral norms. That's because moral norms are principles that guide our actions in line with the primary practical principles, the basic human goods integrally conceived. Norms of morality are specifications of the integral directiveness or prescriptivity of the various aspects of human well-being and fulfillment that together constitute the ideal of integral human flourishing. So if the first principle of practical reason is, as Aquinas says, that the good, bonum, is to be done and pursued, and the bad, malum, is to be avoided, then the first principle of morality is something like one ought always to choose and otherwise exercise one's will in a way that's compatible with a will toward integral human fulfillment. And just as the first principle of practical reason is specified, as Aquinas makes clear, by identifying the various irreducible aspects of human well-being and fulfillment, friendship, knowledge, aesthetical appreciation, skillful performance, friendship with God, and so forth, so too the first principle of morality is specified by identifying the norms of conduct that are entailed by an open-hearted love of the human good, that is, the good of human persons taken as a whole, taken integrally. So for example, what are sometimes called intermediate moral norms, the general moral principles, do unto others as you have them do unto you, the, the so-called golden rule, or the Pauline principle that one should never do something in itself evil even for the sake of good consequences, what your mother had in mind when she said, the end doesn't justify the means. A good end doesn't justify a bad means. Those intermediate moral principles are specifications, they, they are specifications of what it means to act with a will toward integral human fulfillment. And we further specify those norms, and they remain specifications of the general principle. Do not kill, do not steal, do not commit adultery, do not bear false witness. All the way down to the most specific kinds of moral norms. Don't hit your sister. Specifications of the general principle that we should will in a way that is compatible with an open-hearted love of the good integrally conceived, with an open-hearted love of integral human well-being and fulfillment. Now, the reason we can't simply rely on the first principles identifying knowledge or friendship or aesthetic appreciation or anything else as basic human goods is that there are ways of pursuing any good that are themselves immoral. So we need some norms to guide and structure our decision making when we face a choice where we may be motivated by a good to do something but where it would be wrong to do it. For example, take an obvious example. Someone could, someone could certainly be motivated out of true friendship to tell a lie to protect the reputation of a friend. Does it make it morally right that your motivation is friendship? No. The lie is still wrong even if it's motivated by a human good. Not all of our actions are ill-motivated. Not all of our immoral actions are ill-motivated. Some are motivated by a genuine good. 
they are still wrong to do. So the first principles of practical reason, identifying the basic human goods and directing our action uh, toward them, cannot resolve our moral questions. Our moral questions require the application of specifically moral norms, which you may think of as second order reasons governing our pursuit of the human goods which give us first order reasons for our actions. Now, a natural law theory is a critical reflective account of the constitutive aspects of the well-being and fulfillment of human persons and the communities they form. That's what I've argued for so far. So such a theory will propose to identify principles of right action, moral principles, specifying the first and most general principle of morality, will with a will toward integral human fulfillment. Orient one's will that way. Now among these principles, these principles of morality, what it means to will compatibly with human well-being, with integral human well-being, among these principles are respect for rights, rights that people possess simply by virtue of their humanity. So now I'm moving from the first principles of natural law and the moral norms directing our, governing our actions with respect to those first principles to the concept of rights, which I'm conceiving here as themselves moral principles, guiding our choices and actions where we have to make choices. Now natural law theorists understand human fulfillment, the human good, as variegated. There are many irreducible dimensions of human well-being and fulfillment. There's not just one human good. There are many human goods. This is not to deny that human nature is determinate. Obviously, any natural law theorist, as a natural law theorist, believes in a determinate human nature. The human goods are our goods, the goods of our nature, the goods of a creature created the way we are, with the nature we have. It is to affirm, rather, that our nature, though determinate, is complex. We are organisms, we are animals, we are physical, but rational. Our integral good includes our bodily well-being, to be sure, we are organisms, but also our intellectual well-being, our moral well-being, our spiritual well-being. And to add to the complexity, we are individuals, right? We come packaged as individual units, but among the goods that each of us has, among the things that are for our integral well-being, our friendship and sociability, goods that are inherently social, that are realized precisely in forming bonds, forms of communion with others. And all of those are constitutive aspects of our flourishing. So by reflecting on the basic goods of human nature, especially those most immediately pertaining to social and political life, we propose to arrive at a sound understanding of principles of justice including those principles we call human rights. That's what human rights are. They're principles of justice. Justice is part of the larger universe of norms that we call morality. Rights are principles of justice. Now, in light of, in light of what I've already said about how natural law theorists understand human nature and the human good, it should be no surprise to learn that natural law theorists typically reject both strict individualism and collectivism, and this is very compatible with the Christian understanding. It's not uniquely Christian. We get the same thing in Plato and Aristotle. We get the same thing in some other religious traditions, but it's certainly integral to Christianity that we reject both radical individualism and collectivism. Individualism overlooks the intrinsic value of human sociability and tends mistakenly to view human beings atomistically. When Ayn Rand rejected Christianity and rejected God, she was wrong, in my opinion, to do those things. But she certainly had to do those things if she wanted to carry forward her understanding of the human personality, of the human individual. She couldn't have her individualism compatibly with Christian belief or even theistic belief. And she chose, you have to choose one or the other, she chose that individualism. 
fails to account for the it fails to account for the intrinsic value of friendship and other aspects of human sociability, reducing all relationships to what Rand thought they were means by which the partners collaborate with a view to more fully or efficiently achieving their individual goals and objectives. Now, collectivism, to shift to the other problem, problem on the other side, compromises the dignity of human beings by tending to instrumentalize and subordinate them and their well-being to the interests of larger social units, the community, the state, the Volk, the fatherland, the Fuhrer, the future communist utopia. Now, individualists and collectivists both have theories of justice and, these days, even human rights. You would think that there couldn't be, in principle, a Marxist theory of human rights, right? If you understand Marx strictly, there shouldn't be that. But there is. So there are Marxist and other collectivist theories of human rights. Obviously, there are individualist conceptions of human rights. But as I see it, these are highly unsatisfactory, and they're rooted in a common error. It's the, the misunderstanding of human nature and the human good. Neither individualists of the Randian sort nor collectivists, whether Marxist or otherwise, can do justice to the concept of a human person. That's the key thing, the concept of the human person. That is, a rational creature, a creature with a rational nature, who is a locus of intrinsic value and as such, an end in himself who may never legitimately treat himself or be treated by others as a mere means. It's interesting if you look at radical individualism of the Randian sort, I don't mean to just pick on Rand here, there are plenty of other radical individualists. If you look at it, it's interesting. The, the theory not only regards it perfectly legitimate, indeed necessary and inevitable, that people treat other people as means, the theory is you treat yourself as a means, which is interesting. But the concept of human person properly understood is that of a rational creature who is a locus of intrinsic value and end in himself, may not be treated as a means, but whose well-being intrinsically includes relationships with others and membership in communities beginning with the family based on the human good of marriage, in which the individual, the person, as a matter of justice, has both rights and ordinarily responsibilities. I say ordinarily because there are certain conditions or stages in life when we don't have responsibilities. The newborn baby doesn't have responsibilities. Uh, an elderly person suffering from a severe dementia no longer has responsibilities, but they remain persons. Now, human rights exist or obtain if it's the case that there are principles of practical reason directing us to act or abstain from acting in certain ways out of respect for the well-being and the dignity of persons whose legitimate interests may be affected by what we do. That's the way to think about human rights. The way to not think about human rights is in terms of wants. If I want something, I have a human right to it. A lot of human rights thinking is precisely that these days, and it's simplistic and ridiculous. The way to think about human rights is to think about whether there are principles of practical reason, including principles of justice, directing us to act or abstain from acting in certain ways out of respect for the well-being, not the desires, the well-being, the dignity of persons whose legitimate interests may be affected by what we do. Now, I certainly do believe in those principles, so I'm an advocate of human rights. When I, when I chaired the US Commission, Andrew kindly pointed out, of, on uh, international religious freedom, I was out there every day working for the cause of human rights. I believe in it. I don't think Christians should throw over the concept of human rights or re refuse to be associated with it. There are some Christians, credible people, who make the argument that human rights discourse or all rights discourse is so inherently radically individualistic that we should shun it. Uh, uh, Joan Lockwood O'Donovan makes a strong case for that kind of a view. I don't believe it. I don't share it. What we need to avoid is falling into a corrupt understanding of human rights as tied basically to people doing what they want. That's not what human rights. You don't have the right to do what you want. You have the right to have your well-being and dignity respected. So if there are such principles, human rights, 
they can't be overridden by considerations of utility or anything else. At a very general level, they direct us in Immanuel Kant's famous phrase, his formulation, I think it's the second formulation of the categorical imperative, I might have the order wrong, to treat human beings, to treat humanity, whether in the person of yourself or another, always as an end and never as a means only. When we begin to specify this general norm, and of course it has to be specified if it's actually going to direct anybody to do or abstain from doing anything, but when we do it, when we do that specification, we identify important negative duties. Do not, thou shalt not commit murder, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not steal, and so forth, including such duties universally recognized now, but for much of human history not recognized, as the duty to refrain from enslaving people. Slavery was pretty much a constant across cultures and throughout history. It's relatively late in the day that we get the kind of unanimity we have, and it's still not unanimity throughout the world on the evil of slavery. Now, although we need not, need, not must not, need not put the matter in terms of rights, Professor O'Donovan, for example, can translate what I would put in rights language into a language of justice that makes no reference to rights, and that's fine. So we need not put the matter in terms of rights. It does seem to me perfectly reasonable, and I think often helpful, to speak of a right against, say, being enslaved, or to speak of slavery as a violation of human rights, or to defend, as I did in my service on the Commission on International Religious Freedom, to defend the right to religious liberty as a human right. If there are human rights, these are rights people have not by virtue of being members of a certain race or sex or class or ethnic group, but simply by virtue of our humanity. Now my friends, especially my young friends out there, a lot of people today want to tell you they are great believers and partisans and activists in the cause of human rights. I urge you to say, fine, good, me too. But I want to be clear on what we mean when we say human rights. Do we mean rights that we have, that human beings have, simply in virtue of their humanity, simply in virtue of being a human being? That's what I believe. I'm sure that's what you believe. Ask your local human, so-called human rights activist whether he or she really believes it, that all we need to do is establish that somebody is a human being to acknowledge that they have a right. And then we'll do a little inquiry about unborn babies, for example. Don't take people's representation of themselves as human rights activists at face value. There are questions we need to ask. But of course, there are, in addition to negative duties, like the thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, don't enslave people, and their corresponding rights, certain positive duties. And these, too, can be articulated and discussed in the language of rights, though here it's especially important that we be clear about by whom and how a given right is to be honored. Now, some of you may have studied the UN Declaration on Human Rights, of which the US is a signatory. Um, there's a wonderful book on the uh, framing of the UN Declaration of 1948 by Mary Ann Glendon called A World Made New. Maybe some of you have read that. If you haven't, it's a great book to, to read. And I, again, myself, am a defender of the UN Declaration. One of the interesting things about the UN Declaration, what makes it sound very different from the US Bill of Rights, our, our first aid, or depending on how you look at it, 10 amendments to our Constitution, is that the UN Declaration includes many positive rights and not just negative rights. And the reason I'm willing to support that declaration is that we can articulate and discuss positive duties in the language of rights, but it really is important that we be specific. We engage the questions. We face the music about who owes these obligations to whom and why it's them. Sometimes it's said, for example, that education or health care is a human right. It's certainly not unreasonable to speak this way, but much more needs to be said if it's to be a meaningful statement. Who is supposed to provide education or health care to whom? 
Why should those persons or institutions be the providers? What place should provision of education or health care occupy in any particular society, in any particular time, on the list of social and political priorities, since resources are obviously finite and limited? Is it better or not? Is it better for education and health care to be provided by governments under socialized systems or by private providers in markets? or by some combination of public and private? If the last of those, what's the combination? Now these questions, which often go not only unanswered but unasked, have got to be addressed if we're going to be serious and not just engaged in idle, useless political rhetoric where we talk about, I'm for the right to health care, or I'm for the right to education. These questions have to be engaged and they go beyond the application of moral principles. That's what I want you to see right now. They require, in addition to moral knowledge, knowledge of natural law, prudential judgment in light of the contingent circumstances people in a given society at a given time face. Now, often there is not a single uniquely correct answer. There is not a single uniquely correct education system that all societies at all times should have. There's not a single uniquely correct way of providing health care that all societies at all times should have. The answer to each of the questions that we have to ask to sort out for our society here and now how we ought to go about trying to provide for people's needs, make sure people's needs are met, the answer to each question that we have to ask can lead to further questions, and the problems can be extremely complex, far more complex than the issue of, say, slavery where once a right has been identified, its universality in the basic terms of its application are fairly clear. Everybody has a right not to be enslaved, and everybody has an obligation as a matter of strict justice to refrain from enslaving other people. Governments have a moral obligation to respect and protect the right, and correspondingly to enforce the obligation. Now, what I've said so far, I hope, has provided an account, a pretty good account at least, of how I think we ought to go about identifying what are human rights, how they're tied to the human good, and the obligations, obligations in justice that follow from the integral directiveness or prescriptivity of the human good. But in each case, the argument must be made, and in many cases, there are complexities to the argument. One basic human right that almost all natural law theorists would say belongs in the set of human rights is the right of an innocent person not to be directly killed or maimed, not to be directly harmed. Directly means intentionally, with a view to killing that person or harming that person. The very object of the act is to get the person dead or to cut his arm off or to harm him in some other way. This is a right that is violated when someone makes the death or injury of another person the precise object of his action. And it's the right that grounds the norm against targeting non-combatants, even in justified wars, against elective abortion, euthanasia, the killing of cognitively disabled people, and so forth. Now, the natural law understanding of human rights I'm here sketching is connected to a particular account of human dignity, and I should share some thoughts on that with you for your consideration. Under this account of human dignity, the natural human capacities for reason and freedom are fundamental to the dignity of human beings, the dignity that is protected by human rights. The basic goods of human nature are the goods of a rational creature. That's what's a characteristic of our nature. It's a rational nature. We have it from the very beginnings of our existence in the earliest embryonic stage. We retain it as long as we exist. It doesn't depend on what we can do here or now. That's what it means to say it's our nature. Human beings are creatures with a rational nature, a creature who, unless impaired or prevented from doing so, naturally develops and exercises capacities for deliberation, judgment, and choice. Now, these capacities are, stay with me now, God-like, albeit, of course, in a limited way. In fact, from the theological vantage point, at least from the biblical vantage point, they constitute a certain sharing, limited to be sure, we're not God, but real in divine power. This is what is meant, it must be what is meant, 
by the otherwise extraordinarily puzzling biblical teaching that man is made in the very image and likeness of God. After all, it can't mean that God has five fingers on each of two hands and hair on his head and a nose. How are we God-like, made in the divine image? We can envisage a possible state of affairs, a reality that does not exist, at least at the moment. We can act on the basis of our judgment of the value of bringing it into existence to bring it into existence, where our action is not like the action of a brute animal, impulse, or instinct, but is on the basis of a choice rationally motivated. But whether or not one believes or even recognizes uh, the authority of a personal god, it's true that human beings possess a power traditionally ascribed to divinity, and that is the power of agency, the power to cause what is not, strictly speaking, one is not, strictly speaking, caused to cause, to act on the basis of one's own judgment and choice, envisaging that state of affairs and bringing it into reality. Now, the moral or cultural significance of any particular reality we bring into being by our choices and actions uh, uh, could, could be a friendship, it could be a, a piece of art, it could be uh, any project. Its cultural significance, its moral significance may be great or far more commonly comparatively minor. We go through our day exercising our deliberation, our judgment, our choice, doing things that's not usually or not earth shattering. What matters for the point I'm making now is that it's a product of human reason and freedom. It's the fruit of deliberation, judgment, and choice. Now, of course, the further question will present itself to the mind of anyone who recognizes the godlikeness of our capacities for rationality and freedom, capacities that are immaterial, that is to say, spiritual in nature. That question is whether beings capable of such powers could exist apart from a divine source and ground of their being. So one finds in the affirmation of these powers a decisive ground for the rejection of materialism, and one discerns the basis of an openness to and even roots, the roots of an argument for theism. But more on that in just a few minutes. Now, what about the authority for this view of human nature, the human good, human dignity, and human rights? Well, natural law theorists are interested in the intelligible reasons people have for their choices and actions. We're particularly interested in reasons that can be identified without appeal to any authority apart from the authority of reason itself. Now, as Professor Walker indicated in his kind introduction, this is not to deny that it is often reasonable to recognize and submit to authority, religious authority, the authority of the Bible, for example, or even secular authority. Often it's perfectly reasonable to recognize as legitimate human authorities in deciding what to do and not to do. When you stop at the red light, you're recognizing the legitimate authority. When you could cheat and go through and you know there's not a cop around, uh, you're recognizing the legitimacy of the authority of those who make the laws under the constitutional system. Indeed, natural law theorists have made important contributions to understanding why and how people can sometimes be morally bound to submit to and be guided in their actions by authority of various types. But even here, the special concern of natural law theorists is with the reasons people have for recognizing and honoring claims to authority. We don't simply appeal to authority to justify authority. Now, today, there are plenty of people who embrace philosophical or ideological doctrines that deny the human capacities I maintain are at the core of human dignity. They adopt a purely instrumental and essentially non-cognitivist view of practical reason and argue that the human experience of deliberation, judgment, and choice is illusory. The ends people pursue, they insist, are ultimately given by non-rational motivating factors such as feeling or emotion or desire. Uh, this view was articulated even centuries ago by Thomas Hobbes in his uh, classic and profoundly influential work, Leviathan, when he said the thoughts, by this he meant the intellect, the mind, the thoughts are to the desires as scouts and spies to range abroad and find the way to the thing desired. 
not a couple of centuries after that, David Hume, or a century or so after that, David Hume would articulate the same idea, saying that reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions and may pretend to no office other than to serve and obey them. This idea about human motivation and action, which is utterly incompatible with any idea of objectivity in ethics or truth in moral judgments. Uh, this idea, when I, I was saying to Andrew's class earlier today, when I started out my career, it was very popular, dominant uh, among academic philosophers. It's lost its dominance in the academic world, but one still finds it in the popular mind the belief that there are no more than merely instrumental reasons for action, that we're just driven by our feelings. We're, we're animals all the way down. Uh, there are no reasons that are available to us to adjudicate among wants. All reason can do is tell us how to get what we want, whatever it is that we happen to want. Uh, in the end, I believe this is just a self-defeating uh, uh, position. Uh, and one that can't stand up to rational inquiry, but I won't uh, linger on it here because I'm running out of time to give my specific argument uh, against it. Um, since I am running out of time, I uh, just want to say a few words uh, about human imperfection and moral failing. Let's see, there's a word for that. What is that word? Um, sin. Uh, and then uh, a word about religious liberty and uh, natural law. Now, uh, if I'm correct in affirming that human beings can uh, identify, human reason can identify human rights as genuine grounds of obligations to others, how can we explain or understand the widespread failures across human history to recognize and respect human rights and other moral principles? You know, G.K. Chesterton was absolutely right when he said that original sin is the one Christian doctrine for which there is knockdown empirical evidence. If there's a moral good, if there's a moral right, if there's a moral truth, why do we get it wrong so often? And why do we act contrary to, we as the human family, act contrary to it so often? Well, as human beings, we are rational animals, but we are imperfectly rational. We are prone to making intellectual and moral mistakes and capable of behaving grossly unreasonably, especially when deflected by powerful emotions that run contrary to the demands of reasonableness. You know, think of Cain and Abel. It wasn't reason that caused Cain to do what he did to his brother. It was that other thing. All right? Now, Christians have a name for this, sin, and another name, fallenness. We suffer weakness of the will and darkness of the intellect. Even when following our consciences, as we are morally bound to do, and the Southern Baptists were in the vanguard, rightly, of the conscience issue, the liberty of conscience issue, even when we follow our consciences, we can go wrong. A conscientious judgment may nevertheless be erroneous. Now, of course, sometimes people fail to recognize and respect human rights because they have self-interested motives for doing so. Same with the violation of other moral principles. Very often what's behind moral wrongdoing is people's own self-interest or what they perceive as their self-interest. In most cases of exploitation, for example, the fundamental failing is moral, not intellectual. In some cases, though, intellectual and moral failures are closely connected. Selfishness, prejudice, partisanship, vanity, avarice, lust, ill will, and other moral delinquencies can, in ways that are often quite subtle, impede sound ethical judgments, including judgments pertaining to human rights. Whole cultures or subcultures can be infected with moral failings that blind large numbers of people to truths about justice and human rights. And ideologies hostile to these truths will almost always be both causes and effects of those failings. Consider, for example, the case of slavery in antebellum American. The ideology of white supremacy was both a cause of many people's blindness to the wickedness of slavery and an effect of the exploitation and degradation of its victims. And now, finally, let's turn to the question of God and religious faith and natural law theory. Andrew, I know I'm over, but I'm going to wrap up. Now, most natural law theorists are and have been throughout history theists. 
Plato, for example, was. Not just the Christians and Jews. They believed and believe that the moral order, like every other order in human experience, is what it is and not otherwise because God creates and sustains it as such. In accounting for the intelligibility of the created order, they infer the existence of a free and creative intelligence, a personal God. Indeed, they typically argue that God's creative free choice provides the only ultimately satisfactory account of the existence of the intelligibilities humans grasp in every domain of inquiry, not just in ethics, not just when it comes to natural law, but in physics and in engineering and in historiography and in literary criticism and in every other domain. Now, natural law theorists, as Andrew pointed out in the introduction, do not deny that God can reveal truths or that it's very important to us that God has revealed truths or that revealed truths cannot profoundly illuminate even what can be known through a glass darkly by natural human reason. And of course, most all Christians and most other natural law theorists believe that God has revealed many such truths. However, natural law theorists also affirm that many moral truths, including some that are revealed, can also be grasped by ethical reflection even apart from revelation. They assert with St. Paul in his letter to the Romans that there is a law written on the hearts, even of the Gentiles who don't have the law of Moses, a law the knowledge of which is sufficient for moral accountability and even for God's judgment. So the basic norms against murder and theft, for example, though revealed in the Decalogue, are knowable even apart from God's special revelation. The natural law can be known to us and we can, we Christians would say, with God's help, conform our conduct to its terms by virtue of our natural human capacities for deliberation, judgment, and choice. Now the absence of a divine source of the natural law would be a puzzling thing, just as the absence of a divine source for any and every other intelligible order in human experience would be a puzzling thing. An atheist's puzzlement might well cause him to reconsider the idea that there is no divine source of the order we perceive uh, and understand in the universe. It's far less likely, I think, to cause someone to conclude that our perception is illusory or that our understanding is a sham, although that's uh, uh, logically possible.